So last time we talked about uh, what happened in Taiwan, right? So today I'm going to take a little bit of detour uh, from the history and come to present. So just in movies, it happens, right? Flashback, flash forward, whatever. So this is the flash forward uh, from where we were. And where we left was uh, Maurice Chang, okay? And a little bit of his personal story of Maurice Chang, Okay, so the detour is uh, we all hear. I mean, if you look at the newspapers everywhere, you will hear the word called fabulous. If you look at the overall picture of companies, right? How do you create a product, chip product? Huh? Simple. You, you, your IC designers like you are. Huh? Let's say you join Texas Instruments or you join Analog Devices, you join Samsung, Qualcomm, whatever, uh, or Nvidia for that matter, right? Uh, they also do a lot of. So you will be you will be in that IC design blue box. Okay, in there. And there is like an army of people who are doing IC design there. And they are getting the EDS software, which you are already using. Huh? It's like a, you know, airline uh, cockpit, right? There's so many variables, all sorts of stuff. But hopefully, you got the hang of how to use it, right? Uh, so, this EDS software is Cadence, Mentor Graphics, Synopsis. These are the key names, but there are some small names also. You get the EDS software and you play with in your environment and you create your circuits. Now, early days, early days, when I'm talking about when I was a baby, right, when I was doing all this stuff, um, we would, the company, like I was at Motorola, so Motorola had its own fab. Everybody had a fab. They had their own fab. What you would do is then once you finish your design, then you would send your stuff. You know, the, the first few chips I did was all Motorola. Um, so we would finish the chips and then we would say, okay, our chips are coming, you fabricate them. So Motorola Fab will fabricate the chips and they'll take their own sweet time depending upon whose manager is influential. And then, you know, eventually you'll get your chips back, you test them, blah, 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 the whole stuff works, right? Now, so this is that foundry part of Motorola. And the foundry is, uh, is a very expensive, so much equipment that you have to maintain constantly. Uh, and then, uh, so the equipment manufacturers, there are they are all over the world like uh, applied materials uh, asml these are different different companies they will be uh, manufacturing the equipment really you know lithography equipment uh, all sorts of like wafers handling equipment for example that tray that i'm showing you somebody manufactures that tray it's a very uh, difficult one to manufacture right so all that stuff is done by equipment manufacturer once you go through the foundry then um, your chips come out and they come out like this this is like 30 year old wafer I have preserved uh, just in case I needed to teach the class, right? So, uh, so this wafer, if you, when you come back, uh, when you're leaving, you can see uh, there are tiny, 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 tiny squares, okay? And each one of them is a chip. And we were selling that chip for about, uh, I think, 600 to $800, okay? I just want you to, one chip, okay, for $600 because nobody else had that chip. We were able to sell it at that price. Okay, I hope you, you realize uh, this tiny piece of sand I'm selling for $600, okay? Think about that, think about that. Now I think, now I have lit you up because I can see your eyes suddenly, uh, money, 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 right? Um, so this wafer will cost me about $10,000 to make after everything is done. And here I'm printing money. I can get million dollar out of one wafer, okay? How much is the X? 10,000 to 1 million? Because there are so many parts, there are about thousand parts here, something like that. So, so you can understand why this is this fabulous business is important, right? Again, I'm taking liberties to um, to amplify things wherever I want, okay, uh, so that I can make an impact on you, right? So once the chips are out, these are this is the way the wafer comes out of the foundry. It will go to the test people. Uh, for example, uh, AC, uh, they are also in Taiwan, and I think you are hearing now that we are going to do some test facility um, in, in India, in Gujarat. So Dolera, I think that's what. So there is a test and packaging. So what they will do is they will use a laser to chop all these pieces. They'll put some sticky thing on the backside and then they will go, they'll pick up each, each chip hmm, using a vacuum suction and things like that. And then they will do the wire bonding. You, you have to test the chip, okay? Because a $600 chip, you cannot, you cannot just sell it to a person. And what if it fails, right? Then uh, you have to take it back and, uh, so it's an expensive affair. So, um, so all that stuff is important. Typically, we get those chips back in IC Design House, wherever you are, and you test those chips under process, temperature, and figure out if there are any bugs and things like that. So this is what a fabulous piece is, right? Which I wanted to tell you. 
Um, and I'm doing this mainly for, uh, there are many people who are watching this outside our class. So I wanted to educate everybody what this fabulous stuff is all about, right? So designers design and fabs fabricate. Uh, that's something that uh, I wanted to tell you is the blue stuff is what we do and fabrication is done by uh, people uh, in the foundry. Now the stuff on the in the black is very expensive, very expensive equipment, right? What we do in the blue is also expensive, but relatively uh, it's more of a heavy on uh, designers who are paid heavily, of course. A typical designer would get paid in US 150K, not per month, per year. Um, uh, and then you need about 10 people or so to, to get something going, right? So, so it's, it's very uh, manpower heavy. Software is also expensive, so those things. But other than that, everything, if you separate it out, that I will not fabricate. I will just design this thing and I will uh, send it out somewhere else. The one on the right side is billions and billions of dollars. One on the left side, blue, is millions of dollars. So there is a huge uh, 60 dB difference between the two investments. Remember that. Okay, keep that in your mind. And now suddenly things will become clear to you, right? Uh, so what does Fabless Semiconductor Company do? So the first thing is uh, you have an idea for a new chip. Some idea. And I'm going to go through one particular idea. You build a team. You get a bunch of people who, uh, let's say, few of your classmates, you, you build a team, all of you know how to do analog design, you learned here, and then you know how to design the chip, right? You can, and then you get EDA tools. The EDA tools are like saw cadence, everything, which you have already here. And then you have to figure out a system that you cannot just design an op-amp and say, I'm going to be a fabulous company. Huh? That will be useless, right? So what you have to figure out is what is the product that you want to come up with? What are you trying to do differently compared to what the rest of the market is? And then, um, so the specification definition is another team, which is uh, kind of their system designer. So these people are very involved with the customers because you don't want to design that you feel that's the coolest thing. Very important. We have to design something that the market will take. They will buy and they'll give you money. Unless you get money, this whole game is useless, right? Agree? You have to make money. After the specification, you know, you choose the process. So there are different types of process. There is 65 nanometer, 40 nanometer, 28 nanometer, all these. These are nodes, which means, and what do you think logically will happen if you go to um, 18 nanometer from 65 nanometer? What will happen? Cost. The cost will grow exponentially because they are expensive, you know, fine line. Uh, because uh, for the same size, the same square footage, I'm going to get an order of magnitude more transistors to do stuff for you. Okay, so as you go down technology in terms of 18 nanometer, things get very, very expensive. The one that's in uh, in Apple, uh, the recent one M4 is in, if I remember, 2 nanometer or 3 nanometer. And that's the, the only done by TSMC. Okay. And you will, you will choose TSMC, Samsung, UMC, GF, Tower, a whole, you know, a bunch of companies who will do things for you, right? So you have to make agreements with them and work it out. What are, what are you going to sell it at and all those kind of things. So there is, it's a complex decision which fab to choose, okay? Now, it takes nine months. Interestingly, yeah? interestingly, that's my statistics based on uh, what I've seen, is to go from conception of an idea all the way to your first etap. That nine months corresponds to something else, but uh, you can see the similarities, you know, when you're developing a chip. And it takes nine months to get the team and you start working on an idea. About nine months later, you will have a tape out. The chip will, go, will be out and you don't tape out the chip directly to the foundry. Okay, because you will have to absorb the cost of the entire uh, manufacturing in the beginning. As a startup, it's very difficult to digest a million dollars just to tape out a chip. So what we do is we go into something called NPW run. Multi-project wafer. We also like to call it pizza mask. Huh? Pizza mask, you have toppings. So these toppings are uh, chips from different, different people. Okay, so we put them all together and we divide by N. So if there are 10 people sharing the, sharing the process uh, for a certain run, then you divide that by 10. Great deal, right? Uh, but then you get 10x less number of chips, but which is okay. Uh, once you send the chip out, uh, then it takes about two to three months to get the chips back because the foundry takes certain time. During that time, you will develop your PCB, you will develop the whole thing. Uh, this is the way I'm going to test my chip. This, 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 you know, you're kind of making, um, I like to call it fading. Laga rahe, huh? Ki the chip is coming, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to make sure the fielding is there so that you can test it out very quickly. You do rigorous testing, PVT everybody knows. 
process, voltage, supply voltage and temperature. So you rigorous testing because you don't want the chip to fail just because you went from air conditioned room to outside. That will not be acceptable, right? You have to meet the specs under all conditions which are defined. And specifically when you do military chips, they are extreme temperature range. Hmm? Now the next thing is, once you do, you feel comfortable, whatever you have done, then you will sample your chip with your customer. Hmm? I mean, this is, as I said, it's an idealistic scenario. It doesn't work out this way. That's why I said, you know, a person who is really doing a fabulous company now, they'll say, oh, this is way too simple. You know, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work this way. I mean, you have to be really, really lucky to make it work this way. Huh? Typically, what happens, you'll find a problem and you have to fix it. So, of course, we like to call those CYA and CYB circuits. Uh, we, we keep them so that we can, in case there is a problem, I can do certain things to fix it. Hmm? So, those are already there. Once you get a chip that works, then you work with your customer, you book orders, and then, of course, what's the last thing you do? You, you release your final mass set. Okay, I know this is what I want. I fixed all the bugs. And this is the final chip that's going to go out for production. Hmm? And that will cost you a million dollars easily, that final run. Because now you own the entire, um, you know, piece of uh, that, that reticle where you have all your chips are going to be there. Because you can get a lot more chips, okay. So then you start printing money, as I like to say, okay. Because now you, you can see, you know, that's a million dollar worth of wafer, let's say. And then every wafer that you can sell, you're going to get $600. It's a very interesting proposition. Why is this so exciting? Because you're investing maybe a million dollars, two million dollars with a VC funding and you're going to a billion dollar company, right? So the, the order of magnitude is two to three orders of magnitude is where you can reach if you're all good at your craft. You know, if you, if you make sure that everything you line up properly, all things you hit properly, right? Then you can, uh, you can do it. Otherwise, you'll just waste investors' money. No outcome. And that's what happens when you have some missing links in your team, then, uh, then you, you end up suffering. I've been through sufferings, I've been through failures, so that's why I know this. So, um, wanted to show you some personal story, right? Because then you can connect the dots. So this is me in the picture. Um, and this is my first black and white television. I don't know if you know Shatrugna Sinna. Uh, that's, his, that's the actor who's on the TV. Um, and during my time, we had only one channel on television. So this is the, the picture tube. And it's, that's the only bed we had and then the TV was mounted on the bed. On the back side of the picture tube, you see a whole bunch of PCBs, do you see? It's not very clear, but um, so all that stuff, I was able to pull it off when I was in the 11th grade. We didn't have a television at home, so I said, why don't I make it? I was able to uh, get some money from my father and, you know, I would, I would build all these things at home. The reason I'm showing this to you is um, we had one channel. And there is something called, um, and this is again 40 years ago, exactly, uh, 1984. Um, so I wanted to show you something. The reason I'm showing you this is in the television, there is about a size box, this size box. And it has like a knob on the front. Unfortunately, I don't have this television anymore. It's gone. Um, it never, I mean, we purchased a box for the TV from a swap shop. And then we were able to fit it in and everything was, you know, in a box nicely. But I don't have a picture of that box right now. So it has about a size um, piece called tuner. Okay. What is the job of the tuner? Tuner is the, the TV stations are transmitted at different, different frequencies. Right. So job of the tuner, you switch the channel and it will give you output of only that channel, not no other channel. Okay. It was about this big. It was a piece of metal. Okay, and it inside it looks like that and you see the knob on the side. Okay, so it's a pretty bulky uh, piece, right? So uh, it's a handcrafted piece, whole bunch of parts and coils you can see. So people are, you know, in Asia or in China, there will be people soldering each coil and things like that, right? And uh, so this was a very expensive piece. Um, okay, and then uh, there were mechanical switches. Okay, so in certain stage, you want to switch the capacitor or inductor, or whatever, uh, to, to tune to different, different channels. And all this stuff to just change the channel. Remember, all this stuff just to change channel. How many channels do you have now in your house? I mean, right now, nobody watches TV. You are all on the phone. But if you have a TV, HD TV at home, and you have Tata Sky, you have like hundreds of channels or thousands of channels, if I may, right? 
And so that time, that facility was not there because you had to literally go to the television and there was no remote control. You had to switch manually. And there'll be somebody standing upstairs on, uh, on the terrace. Uh, that person would be rotating the, the antenna to get the best reception. So builds character, as I like to say, to watch the channel. Right? So we really appreciated television at that time. So this is what it looked like. Now, um, I want to give you connect the dots with a fabulous company. And this is, uh, I was part of this company, Max Linear. And uh, then, then you can appreciate why I'm telling you all this story, right? Uh, because this is not history. This is like now. Uh, so um, what was the problem? The problem you already know, bulky tuners, they're big like this. And they were there in those, um, if, you, if you look at some of those early HD TVs, hmm? um, early TVs, flat screen TVs that came out, they were pretty fat, if you remember, right? They were thick, you know? What you have now, they are like, piece of glass. No, they're very thin. Uh, so they just have the display and they have a PC board. That's it. But before that, it was this piece which needed to be residing somewhere and there was something, some action, electronic action was going on to change the channel. Agreed? So this was a pain in the behind, as I like to call it, right? Uh, for everyone to deal with this thing. You had to figure it out. Very complex problem because what are you doing here? Uh, you're trying to uh, sniff the signal from air and you're giving some digital output, okay? And that digital output will be displayed. So this idea that was born at that time because of this problem. The problem was bulky tuner, I'm gonna develop a chip which will be the one that you're seeing on the top, okay? And size of the chip, can you tell? Five millimeters by five millimeters. So that is what? Five millimeters by five millimeters, it's like a half the size of my nail. So you can connect this versus this, okay? Amazing, isn't it? So uh, half the size of my nail, uh, that small TV. And the job was basically you sniff uh, your RF channel. You're receiving so many channels uh, like Doordarshan or any other. Although in India, there are not that many over-the-air channels. In US and every other place, there are a lot of over-the-air channels. I mean, I don't have to even purchase a subscription. I can get everything for free by using over-the-air tuner. So um, sniffing those weak signals, which are microvolts range, and then I want to convert them to digital bits, okay? Remember that. I have to sniff that channel, which means I have to clean up everything around that channel and only take that channel and convert it to digital. Hmm? That was the job of this particular chip. Um, extremely hard problem. But then the benefit was huge, right? Because you know how many uh, TVs are shipped worldwide? I mean, I don't think we can even count them. It's like uh, probably in hundreds of millions, right? Uh, so, uh, if you could solve the problem by taking this and convert it to a chip, just a tiny chip, you know, everybody wanted that. Hmm? And of course, this was expensive too because it was manually done. So, what Max Linear, uh, at Max Linear, what we did was, uh, uh, so they took uh, the specifications and then they said that, hmm, uh, should I do this conversion business? I want to inject this innovative thinking into you. You know, how do you think? Because that's what I can teach you. How do you think differently, right? Typically what was done was, okay, there is a whole bunch of set of signals are coming in. I will listen in only to that signal. I will listen in to only to that signal. So for that, I need to move something around that signal, okay, to sniff that signal. Does that make sense? At a very high level, I need to have some frequency which goes around that signal and I can see. What they did or what we did at that time was take the entire thing and let's take the entire thing to digital. Okay, and then we will do the rest of the business in digital. Okay, so the entire spectrum of signal, all the channels which are existing, you take that and you will convert it to digital. And then in digital, I will do all my digital magic. So Max Linear was a, is a unique place where there's a whole bunch of expertise which is in the RF analog mix signal plus digital, right? So then you build these chips which are completely a uh, very different way of thinking. So because of that, you could watch any channel. You don't have to do anything, uh, shift to one or the other. And this kind of replaced all the tuners worldwide. And you can see, you know, what happens after that. Dollar to the power dollar. I mean, they're making exponentially great amount of money. So the company, billions range, market cap. Interesting story about Max Linear also is the founder is Kishore Sidripu. He is from IIT Bombay. The interesting story is this whole complex is named after his father. Okay, recently 
uh, that happened. So you are, we are all sitting inside. I mean, it's not because of that I'm telling you the story, uh, but you can, you can see the dots, right? You can see how a fabulous uh, company travels. Started with a simple idea. And here, in this particular case, you didn't really have to have, a, imagine if you had to have your own foundry, okay? If you had to, if Max Linear had to have its own foundry, this would not have been possible, right? Because foundry itself is a billions and billions of dollars of money that you have to spend. So other analogy I like to give is, um, let's say uh, you're a photographer and you take pictures and you take pictures in a certain way and you have a, you have a knack of taking pictures, okay? So you have your equipment, you take your pictures and then you want to print those pictures. So do you have a photo lab at home? None of you have a photo lab at home. So what do you do? You go to some place where they are good at a photo lab, they have figured out their process and you just give them the picture, the file and they'll print it for you and they'll frame it for you which is equivalent to packaging piece. That was the interesting part uh, is how do you separate the two out and this is what was realized by Maurice Chang at TSMC. Okay, so this is another thing I wanted to show you. The original size of the tuner, again, you know, the one that I showed you, this one, was when I was doing uh, that black and white TV. It was about this big. And it was literally a can, this box, a metal can, and it had, a, it had a knob on the front where you could change the channel. Now, the recent ones, they are something like this, uh, what you're seeing here. And what Max Linear did was is replaced it with a chip. What I'm showing you for comparison is the die, okay? The chip is the package part. The silver things which are there like pins. So the silver piece is uh, the, the dots around the, in the center, they are actually the wire connections. They will go outside. And inside you see a small die. So that die is the 2.5 millimeter by 2.5 millimeter. Okay, and you can imagine 2.5 millimeter by 2.5 millimeter, how many you can fit in this, right? And you can imagine the amount of money you can make by selling these pieces. Because the earlier thing you're replacing is such a big bulky thing. There is always a premium that you get for buying those chips. Okay. So uh, that's my story today. So next time we will build on this. Uh, we will go back to our original chip story, which is history. Uh, I wanted to show you this because this will tell you, give you a motivation. Um, why fabulous is important. Why fabulous is important? You invest a few million dollars and you can get into a billion dollar company. Whereas in the fabs, you have to invest billions and billions of dollars, let's say 100 billion dollars, and maybe you will make, maybe you will make 150 million, billion dollars, something like that, right? So there is a different, uh, uh, different scale at which you can, but at the same time, the idea is you have to have a fab. Uh, without fab, this doesn't exist, right? You have to have good fab. So um, if, if TSMC didn't exist, then maybe Apple couldn't exist, right? You can think about that. So there is a, a symbiotic relationships between fab and the designers, okay? Thank you.